We've been looking for several weeks at the book of James, and uh, we are still in chapter 1, but because today is Memorial Day, we're going to jump to chapter 2 first. So let's look at James chapter 2. I'm going to read one verse out of James chapter 1, which I believe is the key verse to the whole book of James, actually to the whole Bible, and that is, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. I'm sure that most Christians don't, that are deceived don't know they're deceived. That's why we need to tell them. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So James chapter 2, the first nine verses are very good Memorial Day scriptures. I, uh, when I woke up this morning... I wasn't going to go to James chapter 2, but that's the Lord impressed me to do that, so that's what we're going to do. In James chapter 2, verse 1, we find the tenth imperative. The verse I read in verse 22 of James 1 was the ninth imperative in this book or in this letter from James, the brother of Jesus, the apostle, and as he said, the servant of God. What is an imperative? The imperative tense, there are many tenses in the Greek language. You know, in English we have past, present, and future. They have many, many, many more than that in the Greek language. The imperative tense, and as I said, there are in the 108 verses of the book of James. One authority that I read said there are 54 imperatives. Another one said 53. I've only been able to find 50. But I'm not a Greek scholar. But this is the 10th imperative. Be ye doers of the word was the 9th imperative. And and an imperative tense means this. The imperative tense in the Greek language means a command to do something in the future that involves continuous or repeated action. That means you make it the way of a way of life. There is a positive command to do something and there is a negative to not do something. In James chapter 2, verse 1, we find a negative present imperative. A negative present imperative. And the words have not are in the negative present imperative. A negative present imperative means to stop doing this and don't ever do it again. And commandment is from the Holy Spirit. So it's thus saith the Lord. Amen. Do not have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. In other words, don't respect one person, one Christian over another. Or one person. The New King James, you know, the King James says, have not. We don't really talk like that today. The New King James says, do not. The Bible in basic English says, do not take a man's position into account. The English Standard Version says, show no partiality. God's word for today says, not favoring one person over another. The Weymouth translation says, you must not make distinctions. The Good News Bible says, my friends, as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, you must never treat people in different ways according to their outward appearance. 
modern King James, my brothers do not have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, and I like this, with respecter of faces. So the negative imperative again means stop doing this and don't ever do it again. Well, blessed is the man who does the word and not just hears it. Amen? Amen? 1 Timothy 5, 21 says, I charge ye therefore before God and before the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another. Do nothing by partiality. Proverbs 28, 21 says, To have respect of persons is not good. For a piece of bread that man will transgress. This is a very important commandment for these last days. The whole book of James could have been written yesterday or tomorrow because it just absolutely hits 2023 in the United States of America on the head. Speaking of what's coming Jude 14, the other brother of Jesus, so this would be Jude, the brother of James. Jude, verse 14 says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these. Now we're going to find out who these are. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all. That's not good if you're being judged, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, against God Almighty and Jesus Christ. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaks great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of an advantage. Now, if you think about those things, murmurs, complaining, walking after their own lusts, speaking great swelling words, and having men's persons in advantage or in admiration, that's pretty much a description of everybody in the world, isn't it? Notice he doesn't mention here anything about stealing, killing. But he talks about these things. James chapter 2 verse 2. For if there should come into your assembly. He's going to explain what he means. If there should come into your assembly. A man with gold rings and fine apparel. And there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes. And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? God calls that evil. Listen. This is the next commandment. This is a commandment in the present imperative. It means to continuously do this. Listen, my beloved brethren. Do you know there's a lot of folks that have quit listening to God? They've quit listening to the Bible? I mean, the news is full of people that are doing things and saying things and promoting things that they're not listening to God. Judgment's on its way. You know, they just passed out of the Senate in the state of Nevada an amendment to a bill that said if any school prohibits a male from going into the girls' restroom, they can be fined $5,000. Amen. Talking about aliens, somebody said, where are the aliens? Well, they're, that's where they're at. Now, thank God it's not gone any further than that yet. But what kind of human being would ever pass a law like that? An ungodly human being. 
My beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you're called? Verse 8. If you really fulfill. King James leaves out the word really, but it's a good word there. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. The Bible says the whole law is summed up in love your neighbor as yourself. Owe no man anything but to love one another. We're, we, God expects us to love everybody. You know, there was a man by the name of Charles Spurgeon who wrote uh, prolifically. And there's thousands of his sermons still printed in books and on computer messages and computer programs. And he had a, has a daily devotional called Spurgeon's Morning and Evening. And I want to read that actually from today, May 28th. He's commenting on the verse, and it fits right in with here, but he's commenting on the verse in Romans 8, 30, whom he justified... You know, the word justified means declares not guilty. We're not guilty. When you, Jesus bore your guilt on the cross. Now, if you sin after you're born again, you need to confess that and get righteous again. You know, righteousness and justified are the, virtually the same word in the Greek. Whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, that's a pretty powerful scripture. If you're justified, if you're born again, you're glorified. Well, I don't feel glorified. Well, you are glorified. Here's, let me read you what he said. This is just, here is a precious truth for you, believer. You may be poor or in suffering or unknown, but for your encouragement, take a review of thy calling and the consequences that flow from it, we could say the blessings that flow from it, and especially that blessed result here spoken of, being glorified. As surely as thou art God's child today, so surely shall all your trials soon be at an end, and thou shalt be rich to all the intents of bliss, Wait a while, and the weary head shall wear, wear the crown of glory. And that hand of labor shall grasp the palm branch of victory. Lament not the troubles, but rather rejoice, that ere long thou will be where there shall neither be sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. The chariots of fire are at the door. In a moment will suffice to bear thee to the glorified. The everlasting song is almost upon your lip. The portals of heaven stand open for you. Think not that thou can fail of entering into rest. If he has called thee, nothing can divide you from his love. Distress cannot sever the bond. The fire of persecution cannot burn the link. The hammer of hell cannot break the chain. You are secure. The voice which calls thee at, which called thee at first shall call you again from earth to heaven and from death's dark gleam to immortality's uttered splendidness. Rest assured, the heart of him who has justified you beats with infinite love towards you. You shall soon be with the glorified where thy portion is. You are only waiting here to be made 
meet or able for the inheritance. And that done, the wings of angels shall waft thee far away to the mount of peace and joy and blessedness where far from a world of grief and sin, with God eternally shut in, you shall rest forever and ever. Now that applies to everybody. I know a preacher that used to say to people when he was getting married, he said, now, speaking of Christians, he said, now to the man, you treat that woman right because God doesn't appreciate you mistreating his daughters. <laughs> Amen? Amen. But notice he says, if you really fulfill the royal law, that's the law of love, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. I'm going to read that. That's so important. If that's called the royal law, and we're told to be doers of the word of God, and never, ever, ever have respect of a person because of their social status in the world, a faithful version says, if you are tr truly keeping the royal law, According to the scripture, you love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. God's word says you are doing right if you obey this law from the highest authority. Think about that. God's the highest authority. People like to talk about the highest authority, but they think it's them. But it's him. The Passion Translation says, your calling is to fulfill the royal law of love. That's your calling. You know, the Bible says, make your calling sure. Your calling is to fulfill the royal law of love as given to us in the scripture. You must love and value your neighbor as you love and value yourself. For keeping this law is the noble way to live. Williams. But if you really observe the law of the king... In accordance with the scriptures, you must love your neighbor as you do yourself. You're doing right. Weymouth translation, if however you are keeping the law as supreme, in obedience to the commandment which says you are to love your fellow man just as you love yourself, you are acting rightly. But look at those words, the royal law, the supreme law, the law of the king. We sometimes... Forget those words, don't we? There's many admonitions in the Old Testament about God's people forgetting Him. Well, you know what happens before you forget God? You forget the Word of God. And if you forget the Word of God, you're going to forget God. And we're seeing it. Jeremiah 2.32, can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. Jeremiah 13.25, this is thy lot, the portion of thy measure from me, saith the Lord, because you have forgotten me and trusted in falsehoods. Jeremiah 18.15, you know, Jeremiah was preaching because Jerusalem was just about to fall. You know, the, the armies of Nebuchadnezzar had surrounded Jerusalem and they were starving them out. And Jeremiah's preaching to these people. Of course, they didn't like it. They threw him in a well. Thank goodness it was dry. Jeremiah 18, 15. Because my people have forgotten me. You see, they thought we were just fat and snazzy and all the false prophets were saying, no, no, no. Nebuchadnezzar will never take the city. We'll never fall. But Jeremiah is saying, you're going to fall because you forgot God. Because my people have forgotten me, they have burned incense to vanity. And they've caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths. To walk in paths in a way not cast up. There's several more in Ezekiel and Hosea. This is Memorial Day. We're to remember to be doers of the Word of God. We're to remember to love one another. 
on Memorial Day, we're to, originally to remember those who fell in battle defending our nation. Before Memorial Day, it was called Decoration Day. I can remember my mother calling it Decoration Day. But it was originally given to commemorate those and remember those who fell in battle defending our nation. Then it eventually became remembering everyone who died. But really, there's only one who died for all. Amen? And that's Jesus Christ. And he's the only one that can give us a supreme commandment. Amen? And that commandment is, Oh, no man anything but love. Only Jesus Christ died for us, and only he can give us a commandment. And he did, and that commandment is love. Amen? Amen. God has a memorial name. When God called Moses after 40 years, sometimes we think God's late. But see, God was waiting on Moses. Moses, of course, was called from his birth and saved by his mother, collected out of the waters of the Nile River by Pharaoh's daughter, raised up as her own. But when he became of age, he decided that God had called him to free the slaves in Egypt, which he had, but he didn't call him to do it with a sword. And so he, he tried and failed and had to flee the country and went and the, as the Bible says, on the back side of the desert, put a desert between him and his enemies and between him and his family. And God appeared to him in a burning bush. And Moses turned aside. I, I would say that might not have been the first time God appeared to him in a burning bush. It was only the first time he turned aside. Amen? But he turned aside. No, it was the first time because God knows the end from the beginning. God knew this is the day that Moses will pay attention. This is the day Moses is finally ready to listen. Not 100% not yet, but he's willing to listen. And he saw this burning bush and he turned aside and God spoke to him and said, Take your shoes off for you're standing on holy ground. And he took his shoes off and he said, Moses, time to go home. Time to go back to Egypt and bring my people out. Moses said, no, nah, you know, I, I really don't want to do that. I tried that once. I'm 80 years old now, God, don't you know that? Now, when I was 40, I was willing and able. Of course, God had to wait for Moses to become unable. You know, our ability will not get the job done. And so he said, go back and tell them that I sent you. He said, well, wait a minute. They're going to say, who sent me? He said, tell them I am sent you. Now, if you were one of those people in Israel... And Moses shows up after 40 years gone and said, I've come to take you out of here. And they said, well, who sent you? He said, I am. I say, what in the world does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean anything because that isn't what Moses said. That isn't what God said. That's the way it was translated. But that isn't what, I mean, that makes no sense. I am. Literally, and I wish people would study this out. The Rotterdam translation goes into a great explanation of it. But it means I will become whatever you need. No matter what you need, you just need him. Yeah, but I need, no, 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 you need him. You don't, un, no, you need him. He will become whatever you need. God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Do you think everybody has the same need? No. God will become whatever you need when you need it. 
And he said, this is my memorial name. Don't ever forget it. Don't ever forget, I'm the way to whatever you need. Amen? You know, today the world needs lithium to make you know, batteries. They didn't need lithium 40 years ago, or 400 years ago, or 4,000 years ago, but it was there, and it's there because God knew we would need it. Amen? Whatever you need, God will supply. Bible says, Paul said, my God shall supply all your needs. That, that applies to every person in the whole world. Think how many var the varied needs are. Amen? I can remember talking to Prajal Bondari. You know, they were in a refugee camp in Nepal. They were run out of Bhutan because the king of Bhutan is a Buddhist. And these people, these Nepalis who had lived there for a long, long time were Hindu. And so he ran them out of the country. Nepal didn't want them. They put them in refugee camps. <laughs> very close, little huts very close together. And Prajal said, periodically something would catch on fire and the whole mess would burn. I said, well, how long would it take you to rebuild? He said, oh, about a day. <laughs> you know, they, they were not fancy houses. He said, they'd bring in a load of bamboo and a load of thatch and we'd build a new house in a day. Well, obviously their needs are a little bit different than our needs. Amen? But God supplies. And he supplied us with commandments. On Memorial Day, you need to remember what he said. For we are to. He told us what he'll do. But you see, he expects us to do something. I am. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 5, 8. God commanded his love towards us. He commanded his love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 2 Corinthians 5.18 In all, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. You know, a lot of Christians think it's the ministry of condemnation. But it's the ministry of reconciliation. And I'm going to tell you, with all these crazy people running around today, you can't love them without the love of God. You cannot do it. But the love of God's been shed abroad in your heart. You've got to bring it out. Let him out of your heart! For as God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and putting the word of reconciliation in us. 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God loves his brother also. Amen? We're to remember that God loves the unlovable. When you forget that, you forgot you were one of them. <laughs> you know, you might not have been that person, but you're just as unlovable as he was. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, You have heard that the law of Moses says, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, that'd be pretty easy to do, wouldn't it? Huh? 
You don't take any, you don't have to have much to, to, to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say love your enemies. Oh, we don't want to do that, God. Jonah found out the hard way he's supposed to do that, didn't he? God said, go down to Nineveh. Oh, no, God, I hate those people in Nineveh. Go down there and tell them that if they don't repent, I'm going to judge them. He said, well, I'm going the other way so that you will judge them. And he had to go for a deep swim. And he had to go to Nineveh fifth class. <laughs> Amen. Matthew chapter 5, you've heard that the law of Moses says, Love your enemies and hate your neighbor. Love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven, for he gives the sunlight to both the evil and the good, for he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. If you love only those who love you, what good is that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. And today, we've never in this nation, in our lifetime, seen such unloving people that we're supposed to love. But you, got to, you can't be looking at them, you've got to be looking at the Word of God. If you listen to them... You know, the Bible says in the last days, the love of many will grow cold because of the iniquity that's abounding. If you're kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. What's perfect? Love is perfect. Love is the fulfilling of the law. And the Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect. Amen? Yeah, but maybe God's changed it. No, it's forever settled in heaven. But if you show partiality, you commit sin. James chapter 2 verse 9. And are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offended in one point is guilty of all. You know, when you witness to unbelievers, I used to have a little track, still have some, had a <laughs> picture of a guy standing at heaven's gates with a cigar in his hand. And it says, why should God let you into heaven? Well, if you ask most people that, they say, well, because I'm a good person. Everybody thinks they're a good person. And I always say, God only has one yardstick he measures people by, and that's Jesus, and you fall short, just like everybody else. But a lot of Christians think they're good Christians, and they're not walking in love. Now, if you disobey the supreme royal law, the Bible says you're guilty of being a transgressor of the law. Amen? But if you show partiality, you commit sin, you're convinced by the law, convicted by the law as transgressors. He wrote this to Christians. Yeah, but my sins are forgiven, they say today, past, present, and future. You forgot to tell God. If you're convicted as a transgressor, who's right? The people who say your sins are already forgiven, future, or God? Well, we, we know the answer to that, don't we? Your sins are forgiven if you ask forgiveness. No matter after you're saved, you, don't, you couldn't confess your sins before you're saved because your memory's not that good. And you don't have enough time. For he that said do not commit adultery also said do not kill. And if you commit no adultery yet, if you kill, you've become a transgressor of the law. And that, really that's murder, not kill. So to speak, 
So speak and do as those who shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he who has shown no mercy shall have judgment without mercy. We shall be judged by the law of love. Brother Hagin used to say, every step out of love is a sin. Yeah, but I didn't step, I ran. That's right, you did. New American Standard says, talk and behave like people who are going to be judged by the law of freedom. On this Memorial Day, we need to remember God, that he died for everybody. And we've got the word of reconciliation, not the word of judgment. Amen? And we can pass all the laws in the world and it won't change people's hearts. Amen? Only God can change people's hearts. We need to be praying for these people. Because if they haven't despitefully used you yet, they intend to. They intend to destroy the Bible and Christians. And the only thing that's going to save them is the same thing that saved you, the love of God. Amen? You know, there's two kinds of judgments. There's the here and now, where you're going to reap what you sow here, and there's also you're going to reap what you sow then, after you die. So we need to remember and quit trying to change things with the arm of the flesh and obey the word of God. Because God watches over his word to perform it. When it's in our heart and in our mouth. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are I am. Oh, Father, that, that the church would understand that you are everything that we need. Father, we ask you to forgive those who have forgotten the word of God and draw them back into fellowship with you before they forget you. And Father, forgive us of our sins, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Father, forgive us for not walking in love if we've stepped out of love. And Father, get us back on the highway of holiness. And on the center line of love. In Jesus name. Can you say amen?